Okay, welcome to uh, lecture five here. Um, hopefully you have internalized all the previous lectures, um, but this one should really uh, blow your mind. Um, the last lecture was pretty cool, but this one's, this one's uh, my favorite one to give. So um, it's a lot funner in person because this is the one where we have some hands-on exercises, but um, you know, I'll, I'll still, uh, I'll, we'll do what we can here remotely. So, okay. So um, remember in the last lecture, we talked about design approaches, topology optimization, pseudo-rigid body model, and then we talked about constraint-based design and some of the principles of that. And we ended with this really cool principle, the rule of complementary patterns. Um, and so, um, you know, now we're going to get into uh, how I used all that to develop my design approach, which is called uh, Freedom and Constraint Topologies, or FACT. And it's, of course, the namesake for my uh, YouTube channel. So, um, and this is what I'll be teaching later on in that. So, okay. Um, Okay, so let, let's talk about the, the first concept here, which is the concept of uh, freedom space, okay? But um, uh, you don't know what that is yet, so let, I'll introduce it. So consider this uh, parallel mechanism, okay? Um, it, it certainly is a parallel system because it consists of two rigid bodies, this and a ground, you know, stage and a ground connected directly together by uh, uh, wire flexures. Now, um, you might recall that uh, wire flexures are... Um, uh, right, our, our brains like to, to, it's very difficult to deal with wire flexures and visualize how they work um, unless they're in orthogonal nice angles and so this is a little tricky because these guys are stuck in weird angles here and, uh, and so it would be very difficult for your brain to, to visualize how these things move. Um, what you can know though is uh, remember uh, uh, James Clerk Maxwell's uh, law or rule, his, his equation essentially, can tell you the, the, the um, if you wanted to know, if you looked at this and said, well, how could this move? Well, it can tell you how many degrees of freedom it at least has to have. So you count the number of uh, constraints, which is three wire flexures. You take six minus three, it tells you there's three degrees of freedom at least. Now, there might be more if some of them are redundant. But I'm telling you, none of these are redundant, okay? So they're all non-redundant. Um, this is exactly constrained, uh, parallel system, uh, and it has uh, three degrees of freedom, okay? So can you visualize those three degrees of freedom? Well, um, you could put me on pause and stare at it for a while. Um, you could do a modal analysis and, and kind of find them. Or the best way to do it is to apply the rule of complementary patterns that I introduced in the last lecture. So, um, I mean, if you can visualize this, you're very gifted. Uh, visualize. Um, and remember, assume, assume these are ideal wire flexure constraints, meaning they're infinitely stiff along their axis. They can't stretch or compress, but they're infinitely compliant in all other directions. Like, for that, you, you should be able to find, or, you know, if, if you can visualize how it could move with no resistance, uh, like I said, you're very gifted, okay? Um, but you don't need to be gifted. You could be really stupid, <laughs> and uh, if you use the rule of complementary patterns, um, you, you can pretend you're smart, right? Like, it's, it's a way to sidestep inability to visualize stuff. And by the way, I'm, I'm stupid. I, I, this one's very difficult for me to visualize. Um, so, um, but the rule of complementary patterns makes it easy for, uh, for people like me, right? So, so, um, Okay, so what do you do to do the rule of complementary patterns? Well, you, uh, you draw your blue lines through the, uh, the wires, okay? And then, um, you know, and you imagine they're infinitely long and everything. Uh, and then at that point, you might as well dispense with the geometry entirely because, remember, the analysis of how the degrees of, you know, of, of how you find the degrees of freedom, where the degrees of freedom are, is, is independent of the material it's made of, the geometry, the, the shape of the ground or the stage. So you can just get rid of everything but leave the blue lines, okay? Now, I've drawn them on intersecting planes to kind of highlight the relationship between these lines. Let me go back again. So these two lines lie on this uh, horizontal plane, and this vertical line lies on its own plane that's uh, 90 degrees, so it's orthogonal. And these two uh, blue lines intersect at that... Uh, intersection point, or that intersection line um, uh, caused by the two planes, okay? So, so I just drew those geometric identifiers to help you visualize the relationship between those blue lines, okay? 
Okay, so that's a good idea. Just dispense with the rest of the geometry. You know the blue lines. Now find all the red lines that intersect those somewhere at least once. Okay, so you should um, be expecting, you know, how many red lines are you expecting? Well, we'll probably, you know, there's three degrees of freedom, so you better find at least uh, three, three red lines in there, right? So can any of you find any lines? Um, and I'd encourage you to, really encourage you to put me on pause and try and find um, red lines that intersect all three of those blue lines somewhere at least once. Y your brain needs uh, experience doing this. It's kind of like a puzzle and you'll get dramatically better the, the more of these puzzles you do. So definitely put me on pause and then play me when you're ready. Okay? Okay, so pretend you, you did that. Um, all right, um, most people immediately find this dotted black line here. If that were a red line, it would intersect this blue line there, and it would intersect this blue line there and that blue line there. So that would be one of them. So there is a red line there. Um, but then other people start realizing, well, pretty much every red line on this plane that intersects that point, um, because it intersects that point, well, and by the way, that, that can be represented by this. If you had a disk of red lines where the center of that disk is, is right there at that point and it lie on this plane, this horizontal plane, then first of all, it, it encompasses, it contains this red line you found, but it, it, it contains every single red line on this plane that also intersects this point there, or this blue line there. And then, of course, if it's any red line on this same plane as these other two, it's either going to intersect them or be parallel to them, which means it intersects them at, at infinity. So, so if you stare at this for a long time, you realize every single red line in this disk intersects uh, uh, these blue lines somewhere at least once, either in finite or infinite space. Okay? Okay. Well, um, some people also find a red line that's vertical here, right? That goes up here because a red line that's vertical there is parallel to that guy, so it intersects infinity, and if it intersects that point, it intersects these two blue lines right there. And that's absolutely right, but if you stare a little longer, there's actually every red line in that disk will work. Okay? Because if you think about it, Every red line in that disk that lies on this plane intersects these two blue lines there, but they also are parallel to or intersect this guy. You can imagine this one's parallel to as it goes down. It just zips down and intersects it at all these points all the way down there. Okay, so, so all those red lines, if you found those, you're, you're very clever, especially if you're not good at this, this new game of the rule of complement patterns, finding lines that intersect other lines somewhere at least once. Um, but, it, you know, that is the full space, right? So there's, and notice, this first line we found is in both of them, okay? It's shared by both, okay? But if you, you can think about it forever, and you will never find um, a, a red line uh, that lies outside of, um, of this space. So, you know, th there's no other red line that's possible that lies outside of those disks that will intersect those blue guys somewhere at least once, okay? And, and only the red lines in those disks will intersect those blue guys somewhere at least once, okay? So that's the full solution. So what, what does that mean? Well, that means, um, so if we put this right back on top of this guy, the, the, the system here, um, then what that means is if these are ideal constraints, if these are infinitely stiff along their axis but infinitely compliant in all other directions, that means this stage could move with almost no, with no resistance, really, if those are infinitely compliant, around any rotation line in either of those disks, okay? And you could find the first uh, mode shape is this. It's the rotation that you, most people first find, and it's the most obvious. It's kind of like a nice, uh, you know, rotation there about this axis. It's the one shared by both disks, okay? And then the second mode shape is this guy, it's the rotation that often also is common, people find. And then this one um, that's parallel to, or you know, perpendicular to it, um, and that, that rocks up and down like that. So if you, had, if you couldn't visualize it, if you could visualize it, you're a genius. If you couldn't visualize it and you cat it, you'd find those are the first three mode shapes um, with the, the lowest natural frequencies that are much lower than all the other natural frequencies of the other mode shapes. Um, but if you use the rule of comparative patterns, you'd find all the solutions in there. And notice the mode shapes correspond with the red lines that are perpendicular to each other, right? So um, the only way you can get three lines that are perpendicular in, in, within these disks is this one, this one, and that one. You know, of course, sometimes they're skew perpendicular, but 
Um, mode shapes tend to like to be as far away from the other mode shapes as possible, so they tend to be have perpendicular rotation lines within these uh, within these spaces. Okay. Okay, but but really those aren't the only three motions that are permissible, right? These uh, the the three orthogonal ones that correspond to the mode shapes, um, which you think well those are the three degrees of freedom. There's actually more motions that are permissible than just those three. In fact. Every single, if you tried to rotate this stage about, like, say, this red line, that line, you know, or any red line in these things, they would be able to rotate freely without any resistance if those were ideal constraints. And yet, if you tried to rotate around some weird line outside this space, it would be infinitely stiff and be locked up. Okay, so, so first of all, this is the this is called a freedom space. This is the complete kinematic picture. It tells you. Um, every way that stage could move um, freely, right? Um, it, it basically contains all the permissible motions so that it, in one geometric picture you can visualize all the ways a constraint, you know, that constraint system could move. Okay? And, and so it's called freedom space because, you know, degrees of freedom are freedom, so it's the freedom space. Or you can call it the degree of freedom space, right? Um, Okay, so that's the freedom space, um, and uh, but we have a problem here because remember um, Maxwell's equation said, you know, it's six minus the number of constraint non-redundant constraints is the number of degrees of freedom, and we had six minus three non-redundant constraints one two three, uh, that should give you three degrees of freedom. But there's infinite permissible motions in here. So look, look, there's infinite rotation lines in this disk and infinite rotation lines in that disk. That's a lot more than just three. Sure, there's three orthogonal uh, ones um, that are all, all orthogonal to each other, um, but that uh, that doesn't say much because Maxwell's equation doesn't tell us anything. There's no no condition on orthogonal things. That just happened to be magic how it corresponded with the mode shapes. Um, so how do you reconcile this? How how come? James Clerk Maxwell predicts there's three motions, whereas in reality there's infinite ones. Well, you might have noticed when Maxwell said this, he said it equals the number of degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom are the number of independent permissible motions. Okay, so, so first of all, so let me, let me show you this. Okay, so you, 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 whether you realize it or not, you already know what I'm about to teach you. Okay, so say you have a block and it achieves two degrees of freedom. It can do a translation in X and a translation in Y. Those are two degrees of freedom. Well, if it can do those two degrees of freedom, can't it also translate in that direction? A combination of those two degrees of freedom? Well, sure, it can also, it can pretty much translate in any direction in that plane. Okay, if you can achieve X and Y degrees of freedom, you can translate in any direction in a plane. Okay, so, so anytime you have two or more degrees of freedom, they will combine to generate an infinite number of basically combinations, a different number of, of motions. And in this case, if you have two independent trans, you know, translations, you get the infinite number of translations in that plane. Okay, so you already know that. Those are um, the, and what you already know is that there's, there's really only two degrees of freedom in this infinite space of permissible motions. Okay. So even though there's infinite permissible motions, only two are independent. And by the way, they don't have to be the two orthogonal ones, right? If I just told you it could move in this direction and that direction, uh, the combination of those two would get all of these as well. So there's no reason the orthogonal ones, or they need to be orthogonal to be independent. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's not true. It's also not true of the last example. We'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, okay. Um, so let, let's let's look at uh, at this example. This one's a little less uh, clear, or, or a little more difficult to to intuit. Okay. So say you had a body that could tip and tilt, so it could rotate around those two independent axes, right? And yes, they happen to be orthogonal, but that doesn't you know that 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 that's just to help your brain. That you know they could not be orthogonal and still be independent, right? Okay. But um, Okay, so say you could do these two degrees of freedom, these two rotations. Well, isn't it true that if you simultaneously rotated both, say both counterclockwise, uh, the same amount, uh, this would actually rotate, would look like it's rotating around this one? It would, I mean, whether you can visualize it or not, that's the case. And if you, 
if you rotated this one more than this one, you'd, you'd get it to be more like that direction. And in fact, if you rotate these at every possible combination of the rotation ratio between these two independent ones, you would be able to access every single rotation in that disk, similar to the translations. Okay? Um, and so, so um, if you have a disk of translations, you know two are independent. And if you have a disk of rotations, you know two are independent. And they don't have to be. You could pick any two red lines in here. And from any two red lines, you could generate all the others by rotating them different magnitudes. It would, it would act as if it's rotating around one of the other ones. And if you change the magnitude ratios between these, it'll start accessing all the other ones. Okay, same thing with this. You could pick any two translations, and if you translate them different amounts, you know, you could, you'd get translations in all the different directions, okay? So, so first of all, I want you to memorize that. Um, the, um, you know, the, 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 a disk of translations and a disk of rotations always has two independent things inside. And by the way, the math behind this is twist vectors. I'm going I'm to show you this in a, in a bit, but these are, these are twist vectors with pitches of zero, obviously. And if you were to write all these twist vectors, you know, you know take 10 of them and, and, and put, take those twist vectors and find out of those 10 how many are independent, you'd find two are, and it wouldn't single out any two. It would just, two of these are independent. And same thing with this. You could take any number the translations, which are twist vectors with the infinite pitch, right? And, and, and stick them in a matrix and do what's Gaussian elimination. We're going to talk about this in a bit if you've taken linear algebra. And that's how you can find out how many are independent. You'd find there's two. Okay, so let's go back to this example. We know there's, there's two inside this disk and there's two inside that disk. But together, you know, um, there's apparently just three, right? So, so remember, this had three constraints. And so 6 minus 3, there should be 3 degrees of freedom or 3 independent permissible motions or, or 3 independent uh, rotational twists there. Okay? Uh, and that's true. Um, and the reason, but, but you think, well, there, there, there needs to be 4, right? 2 in this disk and 2 in that disk. But remember, they share this, this rotation. This rotation is shared by both along that dotted line. Remember, if you go back. Okay? And so because of that, you really just need 2 from this and one from this. Because two from this, any two from this will generate the whole thing if you linearly combine those twists, right, or combine them with different magnitudes. They'll generate the whole thing, including this one, which will provide one from this disk. So if you have any other one from that disk, it will generate the whole disk. So, so you, because they share one common rotation, there's three independent ones in that space. And trust me, if we took all those twists within those, those, those two spaces, twist vectors, and, um, you know, we did Gaussian elimination, find out how many are independent, you'd find only three, okay? Even though there's two disks, but they're sharing one. That's why there's three, okay? Okay, so that's the concept of freedom space, okay? It's basically a geometric shape, or geometric shapes, you know, these two disks in this case, that in one glance visually tells you all the ways a system can move. Basically, all the linear combination of all the independent degrees of freedom. Um, and, and it's also very important you realize um, if you have one degree of freedom, then you just have one permissible motion, right? But if you, if you ever have two or more degrees of freedom, then you're going to have an infinite number of combinations. Of course, the more degrees of freedom you have, the larger that set of infinity is. It's like, you know, how many numbers between 0 and 1 versus how many numbers between 0 and 2. They're both infinite numbers, but the one between 0 and 2 is a larger subset of infinity, um, or is a larger set of infinity. And so... Um, so yeah, the more degrees of freedom you have, the more infinite permissible motions you'll have. But, but anytime you have two or more, there's infinite, okay? Okay, so let's do an exercise here. Okay, this is where the flexure kits would uh, come in handy. Um, okay, so let me show you what I mean by flexure kits. So um, I've put a, a chair here. Hopefully I don't uh, fall so you can see me because this is a little low. Okay, so... Um, all right, so, so uh, and maybe with the light on me, this is not terribly clear, but uh, in years past, I have these, uh, these boards here. If I hold them like this, it's a little clearer. Okay, so, um, so normally I'd hand these out. And by the way, if you want to play with these uh, after the, you know, once you can come to my office, you're, you're welcome to come and, and play with these, um, you know, if you didn't get to in person. But there are these boards I've cut out with these holes in it, and in each kit has two of these. 
Okay, one kit has some magnets in it to like stick to an optical table or something. And then uh, the bag comes with a bunch of uh, constraints. Okay, these, these little uh, constraint flexures here. Okay, which um, I don't know if you can see those, but they're blue because they're supposed to represent wire flexure, ideal constraint lines. And uh, they're, they're cut on a water jet to be different angles. So you can see if I line them up here. Let's see if I can line them up. Okay, so you can see they're, they're lined up, but they're different, uh, different angles. This one's vertical. This one's angled a little bit more. This one's angled the most, okay? And I have a, a bunch of different angles corresponding to the different holes here in this board. So what you can do is uh, you can plug these in. You can take, you know, of course, these are a parallel systems. So you just need two rigid bodies, um, right, joined directly together by uh, these wires. And you can plug them in like that and then plug them in the top like this. And uh, now you get, this is a single wire parallel flexure system. And you can, as you play with it, uh, with your, your hands, your brain starts feeling what directions are constrained, which is obviously along its axis, and what directions are, are very compliant and, and gooey here. So, so um, you, can, you can make, with these different angled things, you can plug them in and make different uh, parallel flexure systems. And, um, and then play with them and get it, you know, teach your brain what it feels like uh, to have degrees of freedom, to get an intuitive sense for it. Well, this first example, I say build this system, okay, with um, four wires. These are two are vertical and these two are angled. You can see here is what it looks like rotating, okay. And, um, and what I have you do is build those and then I ask you how many degrees of freedom does the system have and then draw the system's freedom space, okay. So, um, if we look at this, um, okay, um, first of all, you might ask yourself, uh, well, how many degrees of freedom does it at least have to have? Okay, well, um, there's four wires, so six minus four is two. It has to have at least two. And I'll, I'll tell you, uh, this is uh, non-redundant. Uh, none of them are redundant. It's, it's exactly constrained. Nothing's over-constrained, right? Um, this is a, a parallel system that's exactly constrained, and so that means it has two degrees of freedom. Okay, so that means you need to find uh, like at, at least right two uh, red lines that intersect them all. Okay, so if you build this, okay, you would uh, again here. Let me see if I can do this. Okay, you would uh, have something like this. If I if I align it with this the system, it looks like this. Here's the two. Uh, parallel ones, and here is the uh, two angled wires in here, okay? And what you do is I'd like you to, you know, hold this fixed and kind of play with it, and you kind of find the degrees of freedom. You can see some directions are very constrained, and some you can move very freely, okay? So your brain, just as you play with it, kind of finds the degree of freedom, okay? Um, or you can just uh, think of the rule of complement patterns. Can you find all the red lines that intersect these four lines somewhere at least once? Well, um, most people find, uh, you know, this, line, say this was a red line, right? This, a line going right down through on this front plane, okay? On this front plane, uh, a red line right here that is parallel to these two lines and therefore intersects them at infinity but then intersects these two blue lines right there at that point, okay? That one is this rotation, if you can see it. If I just grab it and twist it, it with almost uh, no resistance allows a nice rotation about this axis here, okay? Then the other thing your brain might find is uh, kind of this translation, okay? And so that, that your brain automatically finds your hands as they play with it, finds a nice translation that kind of goes in this direction here. And the reason is because if you try and find any, another red line, you can see this guy, these two lie on a parallel plane, or sorry, lie on the common plane, and these two parallel guys lie on another plane, and those two planes are parallel, right? There's this plane, and there's this plane. And, and they're both parallel planes right here. I'm holding it, you can see they're parallel, right, straight on here, okay? So these two planes are parallel, and we know if they're two parallel planes with blue lines on each, we know every blue line on these two planes, because they're parallel, 
would intersect at a hoop, um, a red circle with an infinite radius, so it's a red line that goes in this direction that will intersect these two right planes in any direction uh, to get this hoop, which now if you rotate that hoop, gets a nice translation. Okay, so if you do modal analysis, um, you find these are the first two mode shapes. The two I showed you here, here's the rotation um, about this one that your hands find, and here's the, here's the translation, which is really a red rotation infinitely far away um, in any of these directions, this way, this way, this way, this way, that makes a red hoop with an infinite uh, 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 radius, right? So this is the projective geometry stuff, okay? So you think, okay, well, good. There's two, six minus four is two. There's two degrees when we found the two. But here's the, here's, the, here's the crazy thing is that, remember, if there's ever two degrees, two or more degrees of freedom, there's infinite permissible motions because you could combine these. What if you simultaneously rotate this and simultaneously translate this? Well, if you do that, uh, then you generate, yes, an infinite number of lines that work. So can you find other red lines that we didn't find to intersect all four of these blue lines somewhere at least once? Well. Okay, so if we take our model, you could imagine, what if I put the line right here, okay? So that's on this front plane. It would intersect this blue line there, intersect this blue line like up here, and it would still be parallel to these two guys, so this works. And in fact, every red line, pretend this is red, every red line that's on this front plane that's parallel to those two back ones, okay, would work. Okay, and follow the rule of complement patterns. And so we find that the freedom space is really this shape. Okay? The freedom space of this guy is a plane, okay, an infinitely large plane of parallel red lines that are, of course, parallel to these back wires. Okay, the orientation of this space is, uh, the location and orientation of the space is very important, right? It's got to be on this front plane, and they have to be parallel to those back wires. Um, and uh, it's an infinitely large plane, and then there's also a hoop that causes a translation. Remember, you can draw this arrow anywhere. I just drew it on the stage, but as long as it's uh, perpendicular to that plane, uh, it just, you know, location, translations don't have a location. They only have a direction, okay? And uh, this is a really cool space because it shows you it, it contains uh, lines at infinity and lines in finite space. So you can imagine if I take these red lines and I keep considering them further and further out, eventually when it reaches infinity, it is this hoop. And if I take this li these lines and go further and further out on this plane, by the time it reaches infinity, it's the same hoop. So if I take two lines and pull them infinitely far away, they'll eventually be the same line, which is the same hoop. Right? So th this, this shape with the hoop and all the parallel red lines um, represents, you know, all the motions that this guy could achieve um, right, uh, in infinite and finite space. Okay? And if these were perfect ideal constraints, they couldn't be stretched or compressed along their axis, but they were infinitely compliant in all other directions, this would, none of these would have any resistance as you rotate them. But if you try and translate or rotate anything other than those, um, it would be infinitely stiff. <clears throat> now in reality, when you play with these, you can see it's a little gray area but your brain, it's interesting, your brain immediately finds the two spaces that are furthest, right? These are the two furthest. This one's at the middle of finite space, and this one, or the, you know, on either end of infinity is the, the translation. So they're kind of, the, and they're perpendicular. This, this translation is perpendicular to that. So it's interesting, uh, of, if you take any space, if there can be, you know, the, the, the motions in it the furthest apart and most perpendicular end up being... Uh, the, the, the independent ones that show up um, a, as the mode shapes and the ones your brain kind of finds first and the, the ones you kind of feel first. But if you forced rotations with your hand, if you play with it, you can see you can indeed access all these rotations. Um, <clears throat> but even though the, the ones that are furthest away are the ones that correspond with the mode shapes, and even though those are the ones your brain finds, that doesn't mean those are the ones that are in independent. Okay, because remember, any two of these red lines or one translation in any one of those red lines 